everybody. How you doing? Uh, welcome to Christmas Eve. We wanted to just take a little bit of time to celebrate Christmas Eve as a family. So we got together. We're going to sing a couple carols. We're going to read our uh, Tale of Three Trees that we read every year together and uh, share a little scripture reading and then a short little message um, to hopefully encourage you as you celebrate Christmas Eve there at home with your family. And uh, let's, let's open in prayer. Tasha's going to pray. Lord God, we just thank you so much for this time that you've given us to celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus. Um, God, we thank you. It, it's, it's so much better celebrating this, this occasion when we know everything that came after. We know the entire story, the entire plan that you had in sending your son. So God, we thank you that we're able to celebrate that today. Um, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be present and felt in each and every home that's going to be watching this tonight, Lord. Um, and we pray, Father, that our celebration of your son's birth would be a sweet sound unto your ears. God, we praise you and we magnify your name tonight, Jesus, in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Sing a little town of Bethlehem. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. How still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep. The silent stars go by, yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The
tale of three trees, a traditional folk tale retold by Angela Elwell Hunt. Once upon a mountaintop, three little trees stood and dreamed of what they wanted to become when they grew up. The first little tree looked up at the stars twinkling like diamonds above him. I want to hold treasure, he said. I want to be covered with gold and filled with precious stones. I will be the most beautiful treasure chest in the world. The second little tree looked out at the small stream trickling by on its way to the ocean. I want to be a strong sailing ship, he said. I want to travel mighty waters and carry powerful kings. I will be the strongest ship in the world. The third little tree looked down into the valley below where busy men and busy women worked in a busy town. I don't want to leave this mountaintop at all, she said. I want to grow so tall that when people stop to look at me, they will raise their eyes to heaven and think of God. I will be the tallest tree in the world. Years passed, the rains came, the sun shone, and the little trees grew tall. One day, three woodcutters climbed the mountain. The first woodcutter looked at the first tree and said, this tree is beautiful. It is perfect for me. With a swoop of his shining ax, the first tree fell. Now I shall be made into a beautiful chest, thought the first tree. I shall hold wonderful treasure. The second woodcutter looked at the second tree and said, this tree is strong. It is perfect for me. And with a swoop of his shining ax, the second tree fell. Now I shall sail mighty waters, thought the second tree. I shall be a strong ship fit for kings. The third tree felt her heart sink when the last woodcutter looked her way. She stood straight and tall and pointed bravely to heaven. But the woodcutter never even looked up. Any kind of tree will do for me, he muttered. And with a swoop of his shining axe, the third tree fell. The first tree rejoiced when the woodcutter brought him to a carpenter's shop. But the busy carpenter was not thinking about treasure chests. Instead, his work-worn hands fashioned the tree into a feed box for animals. The once beautiful tree was not covered with gold or filled with treasure. He was coated with sawdust and filled with hay for hungry farm animals. The second tree smiled when the woodcutter took him to a shipyard, but no mighty sailing ships were being made that day. Instead, the once strong tree was hammered and sawed into a simple fishing boat. Too small and too weak to sail an ocean or even a river, he was taken to a lake. Every day, he brought in loads of dead, smelly fish. The third tree was confused when the woodcutter cut her into strong beams and left her in a lumber yard. What happened? The once tall tree wondered. All I ever wanted to do was stay on the mountaintop and point to God. Many, many days and nights passed. The three trees nearly forgot their dreams. But one night, golden starlight poured over the first tree as a young woman placed her newborn baby in the feed box. I wish I could make a cradle for him, her husband whispered. The mother squeezed his hand and smiled as the starlight shone on the smooth and sturdy wood. This manger is beautiful, she said. And suddenly, the first tree knew that he was holding the greatest treasure in the world. One evening, a tired traveler and his friends crowded into the old fishing boat. The traveler fell asleep as the second tree quietly sailed out into the lake. Soon, a thundering and thrashing storm arose. The little tree shuddered. He knew he did not have the strength to carry so many passengers safely through the wind and rain. The tired man awakened. He stood up, stretched out his hand, and said, Peace. The storm stopped as quickly as it had begun. And suddenly the second tree knew 
he was carrying the king of heaven and earth. One Friday morning, the third tree was startled when her beams were yanked from the forgotten woodpile. She flinched as she was carried through an angry, jeering crowd. She shuddered when soldiers nailed a man's hands to her. She felt ugly and harsh and cruel. But on Sunday morning, when the sun rose and the earth trembled with joy beneath her, the third tree knew that God's love had changed everything. It had made the first tree beautiful. It had made the second tree strong. And every time people thought of the third tree, they would think of God. Here's our scripture reading for tonight. It's from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. It says, at that time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And when they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped in, wrapped in snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. It was just as the angel had told them. You know, I've always been amazed at people who can take a cookie and bite it and then tell you everything that's in it. You know, brown sugar, cinnamon, uh, honey, uh, nutmeg, whatever is in there. They can, they can just identify even the slightest of ingredients and tell you what's in there. I think that's like a superpower. Although now that I think about it, the superpower I'd like to have would be the ability to look at a cookie or something like that and know what it's going to taste like before I even bite it. Because then I could avoid, you know, biting the cookies that actually end up not tasting so good and only choose the ones I'm really going to like. That would really come in handy with those boxes of chocolates around this time of year too, wouldn't they? The mystery boxes where you don't know what's going to be what. The ability to just know ahead what's going to taste good and pick around everything else. You know, it would be nice to do that, not just with cookies and chocolates, but with life too, right? to know which things are gonna taste good and which things are gonna leave a bitter aftertaste in our mouths, and then only choose to partake of the things that are yummy and delicious. It's even tempting to do that with this story, too, that we just read. We tend to gravitate toward the yummy parts and, and pick around some of the other things that are there, and you may not realize that there are some bitter flavors in the story we just read. There are some bitter tastes in Luke's account of Jesus' birth. And it's important for you and I to not pick around those, but to see them. Because that's what helps us recognize how this story connects to our lives 
And then we can really enjoy the beautiful flavors of this story and the antidote they provide for us. So think about that story again. Let's recognize some of the, the bitter flavors that are there. Right at the beginning, we taste uncertainty. Right at the beginning, Luke starts with Caesar Augustus and tells us that he's, gonna, he's ordering a census be taken. A Caesar Augustus is the Roman emperor who has essentially declared himself a semi-godlike figure. And he is holding Israel under his thumb. As a nation, he has occupied them. His armies march up and down their streets. He proclaims himself a divine bringer of peace. And yet, the way he's maintaining the peace is with soldiers, with spears and swords. And he's holding Israel under his thumb, and he's just ordered this census to be taken. And that's never a good sign if you're an occupied nation, because what's going to come next, almost certainly, are going to be increased taxes. They're going to try and squeeze you for more. And then you're wondering, how are we going to live if they want to take more from us? And even worse things could come as a result of the census, too. They were living in a time of incredible uncertainty. And there are some people who wanted to rebel against that and violently oppose it. And there were others who wanted to just submit and yield so that things didn't get worse. And the ones who wanted to just submit and yield said it would cost too many lives to try and rebel. And those who wanted to rebel said life like this isn't worth living anyway. They weren't sure what to do. We taste that in this story. We also taste the bitterness of distance in this story. If you learn a little bit about shepherds and what their lives were like, uh, they lived in social distance. Uh, it's the middle of the night. It's dark and it's cold. And where are they? They're out in the field watching sheep. They're not tucked away warm in their beds with their families. Shepherds were known to be, if not outcasts, pretty low down on the rungs of society and often were dirty and messy and earthy. And so they didn't, they weren't accepted into society. They weren't accepted into culture, certainly not accepted into the, the culture of worship around the temple. In fact, the closest they would come to being at worship in the temple were the sheep that they were raising, some of whom would end up being used in worship in the, in the temple. They themselves were too dirty and too unclean to be allowed near the place. And so they knew what it was like to taste the bitterness of being separated from the rest of their community. We also taste darkness in this story. Not just the, the literal darkness, although the whole story takes place in, in the nighttime, in the dark. But the story reminds us this was a dark time for God's people, where they, didn't, they couldn't see what God was doing. They didn't know what God was doing. And so they were stuck there, occupied by Rome, unsure what God wanted, how they were supposed to respond, what they should do. They didn't have a clear path forward. And what they needed was a light to shine the way for them so they would know what to do and how to respond. And lastly, we taste hopelessness here in this story. You know, they'd seen many so-called messiahs rise and fall. They'd come on the scene, they'd gather a following, everybody would get excited, this is going to be it, God's going to use this person, obviously, you know, this is the person sent by God, and, and then one of two things would happen, that person would get exposed as a fraud, or they would just get executed by the Romans, and the movement would fizzle out, and each time that would happen, hope would get crushed just a little bit more, that anything could ever really change, people would get just a little bit more jaded, that there would ever be anyone who could really lead them toward change, and look, hope can't be ridden like a roller coaster, with every up and down it begins to fall off the track, and that's where they were. Look, if you don't pick around them, you can taste all of these flavors in the story here, the story of these shepherds. Their lives were full of the tastes of bitterness uh, from uncertainty and from separation and from darkness and confusion about what to do and from hopelessness. These were the flavors of their lives. And I know these have been the flavors of our lives, especially this year, right? We've, we've tasted incredible uncertainty in everything. All of our habits and routines have been turned upside down, and I've seen the way it's, it's run all of us ragged, and we're afraid, and we've had enough of all of this. We've had enough of uncertainty about what we're going to do next and what's going to happen next. 
We've tasted the bitterness of, of separation and distancing, and I'll be happy to never hear the phrase social distancing again after this year, hopefully. Um, and at times it's been inconvenient, but at other times it has been downright painful to be separated from people we love who are sick and in the hospital or in the nursing home or going through funerals where we can't all be there. We've tasted the bitterness of distance this year. We've tasted darkness in many forms this year as well, too. Confusion about what's right and what to think. We're, we're not sure what to do or how to think at all uh, because there's just so many different stories out there claiming to be the truth. We've seen the darkness of violence, the darkness of racism exposed. We've seen constant political fighting over everything. And I cannot remember a year in my life that felt darker than this year. And we've tasted hopelessness, too. I've heard it in some of your voices. I've seen it in your eyes, focusing on all the things you've missed out on, things you're not going to get to experience. Um, I had hoped that we'd be back together by Easter, and here we are recording a Christmas Eve service. Uh, we hoped that summer would get rid of this virus, and it didn't. And then all year we were hoping, oh, we'd get a vaccine. Now we've got multiple vaccines. And yet even that somehow hasn't given us hope because people are worried about the vaccines and all of that because of the way the year has gone. And everyone's just in a place of darkness and confusion. And that has led to hopelessness. And, and these bitter tastes in our mouth have, have brought us to this place where the roller coaster has gone up and down and our hope has fallen off the rails. People are jumping out of the cars. It's been a year that has tasted bitter in a lot of ways. And so I know that you've tasted the bitter flavors of uncertainty and separation and darkness and hopelessness this year. And I, I want you to see those same flavors are in this story too. And that's why this story is so powerful. It's not some magical other fairy tale land. It's real life, the way we're experiencing it now even. This is what life tasted like for those shepherds there. And I'm hoping you'll also recognize how different life tasted for them after this night and how encountering Jesus transformed everything for them and, and all the bitter flavors of, that life had shoved down their throat were now overwhelmed by the most delicious news they had ever heard and could ever even imagine. And when they accepted this delicious news that the angels brought them, they tasted, maybe for the first time ever, certainty. And for the first time in their lives, they had evidence that God was doing something to rescue and save them. And it wasn't just that the angels appeared in the sky. It was the sign they gave them that they would go to Bethlehem and they would find a baby wrapped up in cloths and put in a feeding trough, a manger. Now, I know you and I see that every year. They had never seen anything like it. People didn't do that. And so when they went into Bethlehem and they saw Jesus wrapped there in those cloths and lying in that feeding trough, they knew everything the angel had said had come true. Everything the angel said about God is sending a Messiah, a Savior, to rescue the world, to bring peace to men, wholeness and wellness. They knew it was all true and they had a certainty for the first time ever. They tasted closeness that night. All their lives, they were lower class at best, cut off and separated. And here now, they're standing in the presence of God. Maybe even getting to hold him. And that must have just overwhelmed them. To have gone from being the guys who were out in the field outside the city to now being in the very presence of God. They tasted the beauty of God drawing close that night. They also tasted light, not just the, the physical brilliance of the angels that they witnessed shining in the sky, but what they witnessed was God shining a path toward real peace, toward a way out of everything that was keeping them trapped in confusion and darkness. They saw God blazing a path. They could finally see a path. And they tasted hope. They didn't walk away that night saying, okay, well, let's see how this kid grows up and then, you know, we'll see how he turns out. No, they, they started right that night telling everyone they met about Jesus and about what the angel had said and what they had seen. Everything they tasted that night convinced them, 
overwhelmed their senses with the delight of hope that they had never tasted before and that they couldn't contain. They started telling everyone what the angels had said and how it had come true and how God was moving to rescue and save. And then I love the way their story ends. If, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but verse 20 says, The shepherds then went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. It was just as the angel had told them. What do you mean they went back to their flocks? <laughs> like, they went back to life as normal? Like, nothing really changed? They just went back to life the way it was before they met Jesus? Yeah. But now, everything tastes different than it had tasted before. Because look at the way they went back. It says they went back singing and praising and marveling at what God was doing. They went back but now their mouths were full of the flavors of hope and certainty and light and closeness. And that transformed the way everything else tasted. Now I'm praying you and I experience that tonight. I'm praying we experience what it is to encounter Jesus the way those shepherds did. You and I have the incredible benefit of running to see Jesus but we're not just running to see a baby in a manger. We get to see his whole story, the things he said and did, the way he died and rose again. And so you and I can taste and see everything that he did. And in Jesus' entire life, we can taste ultimate, real certainty and closeness and light shining away for us and giving us a real hope that's solid and tangible. So tonight, I just encourage you, do what the shepherds did. Drop everything and run and look at Jesus. Read through Luke's gospel. Take a good long look. Get up close to the light and you'll find hope and certainty that Jesus can give you new life and transform everything around you. Taste and see that Jesus is good and that will change the way everything else in your life tastes. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would encounter your peace this night together as a church family and around this world. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Feliz Natal. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.